So we're looking at the Math 2 and Math 2 Honors First Semester Final Review. This is looking at Unit 3, which uh, both classes called Unit 3. This is Chapter 3 in the book. So, uh, first one says, a student makes a claim about the two triangles that can be proved congruent. Choose the correct statement. Well, I have some labeled sides. I also have vertical angles here. I don't have anything else given to me. There's no other information. We can't fall into the trap of using it looks like there's other sides or angles that are the same. So that's the case. We're going to go with D. Uh, the triangles can't be proved congruent. You need something else, not enough information. Uh, next one, we move down to our sets. This is going to be true, false. So the first one, side angle side, that is false because I do not have two sets of sides. I don't have the angle between. That does not work. For B, I'm going to mark these two sides or this shared side uh, congruent. That means reflexive property. And then I have HL, right triangles. And then hypotenuse was the shared side. Legs are these. That one is true. For uh, C, we have triangles congruent by angle side angle. Kind of like A, these are not next to each other. I don't have two sets of angles. So this one is false. Not enough information. D, though, I have vertical angles here that I can mark. Now with what I was already given, I have two sets of angles and the side between, so this one is going to be true, is going to be angle side angle. For E, I have reflexive property matches and then three sets of sides match to each triangle, so that is true. F, triangles congruent by angle angle side. I'm going to mark vertical angles here. This one we got to be careful if it's angle angle side or angle side angle. I have two sets of angles and the side is not between them. So we look here, S is not between A's, so that is true. We look down at our proof on three through five. First off, we are given that AB is congruent to DE and A is congruent to E. And I'm going to label those there just to give me an idea uh, kind of as I work through the proof. ACB and DCE are these two angles. And like we've already talked about up above, these are vertical angles. So our reason for that one is going to be answer D right here. So I write D and I'm going to write vertical angles just so I kind of have that reference. Maybe it helps me as I work through. So now it's saying that ACB is congruent to DCE in the whole triangles. So really if I look at my multiple choice options, it could be this one or this one. I'm going to cross out D because I already used it. Why I'm picking those are those are our types of triangle congruences. So it's not really of figure out which triangle congruence it is. It's which one of these two. Use a multiple choice to your advantage to that. So if I look, I have two sets of angles here and here as well in the picture. So that kind of already leans me to being angle angle side because that has two angles in it where side angle side only has one angle. So E looks like a really good choice. Um, the side is not between the angles, so yet we're going to go with E, angle, angle, side. So I can also cross that out. My last reason is why BC is congruent to EC. And I'm going to use multiple choice to help me again. I know it's not A because that was really the choice between A and E on the previous part. So why would those two parts be congruent? So let's see. If lines are parallel, then corresponding angles are congruent. Okay, I'm not talking about angles, and I'm not have parallel sides, so that's, that's probably not looking good. Uh, corresponding parts of congruent triangles congruent. Well, I had congruent triangles. These are corresponding parts, BC and EC, so I'm going to go with corresponding parts congruent triangles congruent. So that's going to go right here as C. And that's C, P, C, T, C. You know what? As I'm looking at that, I actually labeled the wrong angle here. It should have been angle A and D to start. Um, that still keeps it the same as angle, angle, side, but we got to clean that up. For number six, first thing I notice here is I have two sides that are the same. So that means this triangle is isosceles. That's really all I need those side lengths for because really the problem is going to focus on angles. So if it's isosceles, I know both of these angles are 52 degrees. Together, I have 104. I subtract and I have 76 degrees. 
So if then we go to B, 36 and 72, I add those together, I got 108, which puts 72 degrees there. Kind of like 6A, these match to make these two sides congruent. 4X minus 7 is a distractor put there. I'm going to do 3X plus 1 equals 5X minus 15, 2X equals 16, and X equals 8. Now for C, I'm going to, I kind of have two options here. The exterior angle theorem says that X is equal to the interior non-adjacent angles, so that'd be 41 plus 72. But the reality is a lot of times we don't remember that property. You can get to it a different way. If I add these two together, I get 113. 180 minus 113 is 67, which figures out that angle, which is a common way we look at it. And, and then you can do 180 minus 67, which really still gets you to the 113, but it, sometimes we don't remember that rule. It, it still works. Now for our next set, we have our proof. First off, BD is a perpendicular bisector of AC. So it means it's perpendicular and it bisects. So it probably is gonna address both of these, the fact we have right angle and it bisects. So here AD and CD are the bisector part of it. So we need something about maybe a, a midpoint, um, a bisector, something we can use. I like this one right here, definition of a bisector. Because it this line bisects at point D, it's going to make that segment into two congruent parts. Now ADB and CDB are the right angles. This is the perpendicular part of it. For this one, I'm going to go with G, perpendicular lines form congruent right angles. That is the fact they're perpendicular. So those are gone. Now the next one, BD is congruent to BD. Looking at the multiple choice, it could be transitive property or reflexive property. And these are both here because we have to make sure we keep them uh, separate and use, use them in the correct way. When it's the exact same thing congruent to itself, we need to know that as being reflexive property. So that will be D. And then last, we're saying how the two triangles are congruent. Well, I only have certain ways I can name triangles congruent. This is going to really going to be E or F. So even though I still have a bunch of options here, these are the two I'm going to focus on and looking at the picture. I have two sets of sides and the angle between. Now just because there's a right angle there doesn't mean it has to be HL for this problem. It, it's not. It's not one of our options. Uh, so I'm going to go with side angle side, two sets of sides and the angle in between. So that will be E side angle side. For number 11, we're looking at transformations. So we're going to take this original shape in A. We're going to create the image by going 7 to the right and 2 up. So that means I'm going to take everything and go 7 right, 2 up. So this is my new point for C. Here's where A is going to go and B. Now what I did there was I didn't count every single point, 7 to the right, 2 up. I moved C over to here. And then I kind of recreated it using the directions I already had off this triangle. So like I looked at C and said, oh, it went up three to get to A and over four to get to B. So I just kind of made it here. It, it still works the same because that, that transformation is going to hold congruence and still going to be the exact same triangle. So that is where um, A prime, B prime, C prime, our image now goes. So this is part A. Now for B, we're going to transform and label to create RST by reflecting it across the x-axis first and then rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise about the origin. So x-axis means we're going to go down. So when I do a reflection and I have this line of reflection, the points are going to be the same distance from that line on the opposite side. So here's the line. If I look at B, it's going to be one unit down where it was one unit above before. C will be right here, one unit down. A is four units away, so that's going to go down four. It was also three from C, so I have it here. Now that's really my first step in the problem, so I'm not going to draw that triangle in yet. I'm now going to rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise. 90 degrees counterclockwise is going to go into this bottom right quadrant. So I'm going to first just think of this side. This side, when I rotate it 90 degrees, is going to be facing down. 
So I need to rotate over it and kind of base it off of that side. Well, if I went over one, down one, and I rotate 90 degrees, it's still gonna be at that spot. So that's gonna be my new kind of starting point. This line rotates down and it needs to be four units. So it's gonna go to right here. So that's this side to here. This side, which is three units, is gonna rotate from being vertical to horizontal. So it'll go out three units. So now I need to match up my corresponding letters. C is here, then here, and it's corresponding to, it looks like T. A went from here to here, and that's R, and we're left with S there. Okay, now number 12, we're looking from R, S, T to U, V, W. So I'm looking here, uh, first thing I could have done is done a reflection. So I'm gonna say reflect about, it's gonna be the Y axis. And that would take to right here, here and here. And then from there, I'd have to shift up. So then we'll say translate up one. Now, what I also could have done is done the reverse of that in the opposite order and gone translate up one and then reflect over and I would have gotten to the same spot of U, V, W. Now, next one, R, S, T to L, M, N. I first notice it's kind of facing the different direction. So I'm gonna first rotate R, S, T about the origin. I'm gonna go 90 degrees clockwise. And then when I do that, S comes to here, then it goes from S to T, it's five units, so that's here, and then R would have been there. So this is R, S, T rotated, 90 degrees clockwise about the origin. Okay, now I'm gonna translate. So if I look to translate, I wanna take this point to M. So I wanna go over and up. Looks like I'm gonna go over one, two, three, four, five, six, up two. So translate left six, up two. Okay, last part, create the transformation. So we have x minus one and negative y. Now this one, it can be tough with the notation. What I would do is write in my points, r, s, and t, and then actually do the transformation with the points and then graph the new result. So r right now is five, five, s is one, two, and t is six, two. So when I go through, I'm going to subtract 1 from x, and I'm going to change the sign on y. So subtracting 1, my x values become these. And then changing the sign on y, I have these. So I'm going to go in and graph it. Change colors. 4, negative 5. is here, zero negative two, and then five negative two gives me this triangle, which appears that I reflected and then translated one to the left or translated one to the left and reflected. To, to hold up congruence, it still is a congruence transformation. Last set for chapter three, rigid motion preserves congruency is true. Translating figures across the y-axis can be written as negative x, y. Well, if we look here, we reflected across the x-axis and you had a negative y. So whenever you want to reflect across an axis, you make the opposite letter, x or y, uh, the negative. So that is true. And rotating a figure 90 degrees counterclockwise can be written as x, y, negative y, x. Well, let's look here. 90 degrees counterclockwise, we took these points from RST and moved them to here. So that means that 5, 5 went to here, which was 
5, negative 5, which at first kind of holds it up, but we, we want to keep going. Let's check some more. Um, S was 1, 2. That went to be 2, negative 1, which is not the signs flipped to negative. It actually looks like X should have been negative. Y should be positive, so we're going to put a false on that one.